I'm Vicki Weiner, um, the Deputy Director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. I'm very happy to be here this afternoon moderating a very distinguished panel um, who are going to talk about the issue of historic preservation and planning and the relationship between them. Um, as Chair Srinivasan just very articulately uh, spoke of, um, you know, through the Landmarks Law's success, we have seen many communities that seek landmark designation, and in many ways, they're seeking landmark designation as a planning tool. They are very interested, of course, in the architecture and in saving their places, but they are seeking the use of the Landmarks Law to help manage change in their neighborhoods. And I think throughout the panels this morning and early in the afternoon, we saw some really wonderful examples of various approaches to preservation. And it always strikes me, and I think a, as just a framing concept before we get going with the panelists, that in New York City, we have such a powerful landmarks law that the term preservation is synonymous with the landmarks law. When, when people in New York talk about preservation, they are often talking about applying the landmarks law. We don't really distinguish between them. So it, it strikes me that what communities are seeking, and I was asked to speak a little bit about the community perspective on preservation, communities are often seeking a broader approach. Uh, preservation embraces a broad approach, including interpretation, including placemaking, including zone, using zoning tools for preservation. All of these things are preservation, but often we get into a little bit of a situation where we have such a powerful hammer that we are turning all of our situations into nails so that we can use it. So what this afternoon's panel is going to talk about are the various assets of this, the aspects of this, and how the two fields interplay with one another. Has land, uh, application of the Landmarks Law been effective as a community preservation tool? Um, we've heard much about its great success with so many historic districts. Are there other tools that we should be thinking about, talking about, and using, as we saw in the wonderful examples of Detroit and New Orleans and Los Angeles, and just now with Mumbai? So with that, I'm going to bring up uh, our first speaker. We're going to be a little unorthodox. We were at Ken asked to go last. <laughs> so he's listed first, but he's not going to go first. Um, we're going to bring up Randy to get us started. This is Randy Mason, who's the chair of the preservation program at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, in my 10 minutes, um, I'm, uh, I'm afraid that uh, most of, I think, of the important points that I would want to convey have already been made in actually very charismatic ways by both Maurice Cox and Rul Marotra. I think both of those presentations, I hope everyone was taking careful notes because there was a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, uh, lessons, I think, for the, the field of preservation in those two talks. Um, but I'll try to, uh, to give them maybe um, uh, a little different perspective um, uh, of, of some of these same core issues by talking about um, what I regard as the, the culture or the cultures of preservation and how the ways that we think about preservation, the ways we've come to think about preservation, do shape very materially um, not just the way that we argue and the way that we like to think of ourselves, but uh, they affect the way that we uh, choose tools, the way that we choose partners, the way that we tactically deploy preservation, uh, sometimes against planning, sometimes for planning. Uh, so the... Um, uh, I'll start by talking in a slightly critical way about the cultures of preservation. Um, the, I, I, uh, the, the, the mantra, I, I'm not a preservationist, has already been uh, claimed by both Maurice and Raoul. My version is usually, don't call me a preservationist. Um, uh, and one of the, 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 the reasons for that is that the preservationist label I think tends to be associated with those outside the field uh, as an epithet, as, uh, as a, 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 a label that we, uh, that we place on people who are only interested in, in the most narrow concerns that have to do with the built environment, only with the most beautiful, the most valuable, uh, the best designed buildings. Uh, and that the, the, the corollary of that is that we, uh, the preservationists always say no to change. Uh, and while I think that that is important, uh, of course, in some cases, in some buildings, and we point to these, uh, these great icons like Penn Station, when we think of the, the most valuable buildings that we most dearly want to curate, um, that in, a, uh, in the end of the day is an extraordinarily limiting way of envisioning what the culture of preservation is. And I think we need to, to make this transition that, again, Raul uh, and Maurice have prefigured in their talks, a transition away from preservation culture premised on the, the, the sanctity of the building or the object as the, the objects of our, of our attention 
to this notion of culture as a frankly changeable um, but extraordinarily uh, important uh, um, resource for, for living together. Uh, that's the, the, the sort of definition of culture that I usually default to. I think it's UNESCO uh, sort of um, basic definition that culture is, uh, cultures are ways of living together. Think of all the things that that invokes. So if, if preservation, uh, we think of preservation as a culture, um, two of the pillars of that are, are landmark buildings such as uh, uh, as, uh, as Penn Station. Um, those, um, again, when, once we get outside of our culture and ask people what they think of it, they tend to, to uh, talk about us as if we were fundamentalists. Uh, and I think that that is a strain in preservation that we have well earned, but we need to try to uh, put in context and, and again, redeploy to, to other ends. Uh, curatorial treatment and righteous advocacy of, of the most valuable buildings is and will be part of our brief but it can't be the, the whole of our brief. Uh, the other pillar of preservation culture that I always like to, uh, to um, try to reflect on uh, is this, um, this culture of uh, fighting, uh, that we are always uh, in an adversarial uh, relationship to everyone else proposing any other change in the built environment, whether they are owners, whether they are citizens, whether they are architects. Um, and that we're always spoiling for a fight. And I always point out two things about this picture. One, that it was taken by Stanley Kubrick, um, who was a photographer before he was a filmmaker. It's in the Museum of the City of New York collection. The other is that if you can see, if the, if the uh, resolution is good enough, you can see that the two kids who are fighting are also smiling. They're not just fighting, they're, they're loving the fight. Um, they're loving the, this, uh, this idea that, uh, that their work consists of, of fighting together. Uh, fighting each other, and so uh, we have to fall out of love um, with uh, with the, the boxing and with the the, the the sort of battle metaphors. I think in, again, in order to claim more important ground as uh, as co-designers and co-collaborators uh, in the larger um, set of issues that are at stake when we talk about planning. Um, again, the the curatorial architecture, fabric-based um, uh, habits of preservation work really well when it comes to the, um, the, the, you know, these few uh, charismatic buildings, but they don't work very well when we talk about um, the, the rest of the built environment, where I think most of us spend most of our time working. Uh, for instance, in this part of Philadelphia called Brewery Town, uh, which mostly looks like a prairie uh, because it's been deconstructed over the years, disinvested in. That is a brewery in the background, but the, the row houses, uh, the other factories, the streets, the lots, the, the, and more, uh, more importantly, the life of this neighborhood has been mostly lost, if not transformed, out of, uh, out of recognition. And this is the challenge for preservation. This, um, th this is a, a weak example in light of, of uh, Detroit, um, but it is, uh, I think, a common circumstance in, in most cities. Certainly Philadelphia um, has uh, extraordinarily struggling as well as thriving parts. Um, and so we, uh, as we are called forth um, as preservation professionals to contribute to the reimagination, redesign, transformation of places like Brewery Town um, or uh, places like Penn Station, um, what new are ideas and what new inspirations can we hold on to? Uh, there are, I, I, uh, I, I, won't, I only have 10 minutes, so I won't give you the hour and a half long lecture uh, version of uh, recent theoretical, um, I think, advances in historic preservation. But things like values-based conservation, things like cultural landscape theory, pave the way for preservation to, to internalize change, to understand change as one of the qualities of the places that we are taking care of, that we are helping design. And Prospect Park is one of my favorite examples of this because it is a, a, a renowned landmark by great designers. It has also changed very dramatically in some of its aspects. It continues to change and transform, and its changeability and its flexibility, its performance, if you will, as a public space relevant to, to New Yorkers uh, is, is absolutely part of its heritage value and part of its social value. And to be able to square those two things in the frame of, of one holistic perspective of design is, is really the, uh, this in, the integration of preservation and planning that I think that, that we're seeking. Certainly that I was hearing in the aspirations uh, that, that Maurice was talking about, that Rule was talking about, and also that Will Cook was documenting this morning and talking about the different innovations in preservation law around the country. 
Uh, so uh, how does this happen uh, in, in, in various kinds of places? Well, it's happening all the time. It's not often called preservation. And this is where we need to enlarge our perspective uh, and to, to see ourselves as designers and urbanists and planners as well as preservationists um, in places like the Schuylkill Waterfront in Philadelphia where one might see in this picture uh, only the towers and the cranes, uh, but I would point you to the post office and 30th Street Station, these great architectural icons that, whose reuse has really been the seed of this uh, enormous um, growth spurt for the Philadelphia waterfront. See the same view from a different perspective, um, and you might recognize the little eagle on the left there. It's a, a, a relic from uh, old Penn Station transported to, to the Schuylkill River. Uh, it's a different, different lens through which to see the same scene. So metaphorically, you can imagine how, um, depending on your, your one's first um, uh, affiliation with a project as a preservationist or as, a, as an urbanist, that, uh, that usually casts the die, and we have to understand the multiple perspectives more robustly. So going forward, um, the, uh, I won't belabor a lot of examples, but I did want to put in one plug for, as an historian, for, think, for looking backwards as well as looking forwards for the, the kinds of solutions um, that might meet this challenge of doing both preservation and planning. If you look at early 20th century Rome, they faced many of the same problems American cities do these days, how to reinvest in fallow land, how to extend uh, new parts of the city. These are all the orange parts you see here. And uh, in, even in the most, uh, the most dense parts of the, the center of Rome, um, architects in the early 20th century, architects, planners, preservationists, people who participated in all these fields at once, uh, evolved theories and practices uh, uh, to, to actually change the built environment in order to make it perform better as both an historic center and as a modern city. Uh, Gustavo Giovannoni is uh, one of these great unknown, uh, or unknown to us um, practitioners of the early 20th century who used the metaphor of thinning, like you thin a forest in order to make it stronger. That's a controversial thing to say in a place where, as, as Vicky has pointed out, preservation is more or less equated with uh, a very strict and successful regulatory regime. So how do we think about uh, taking care of our cities as if they were forests, as if they were um, natural places of great complexity uh, that, whose, whose care was um, uh, more um, uh, demanding a, a whole set of tools and a whole toolbox as opposed to uh, just uh, this one uh, magnificent law that, whose, uh, whose anniversary we're celebrating. So I'll leave it there and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Next, we have Claire Weiss, who is the principal in charge at WXY Studio. I'm going to do this. I'm not sure if my slides made it, but like good radio, I, I think I can describe uh, the intention of this uh, short uh, preface. So we could, uh, when I look around this room, I see a group of people that is not, in many other cases, not in a room together, and that is lawyers and architects. Now, at least in terms of really having to be, in terms of the landmarks law, and I, I go right back to the, the way the landmark submission is run, it required two architects to be on the commission, which is rare, right, where architects are actually required to be on commissions, and yet we have a, a kind of law that sets up uh, preservation for the entire city. So in that sense of, of uh, shaking things up, I want to talk through two examples, uh, one a district, the South Street Seaport, and the other one a relatively new building, uh, One Chase uh, Plaza, as examples of um, the kind of dialogue that has happened between architects and lawyers, and at the same time, what do both of those situations really mean in terms of today? So first off, uh, I would posit that physical planning is an art not practiced by very many people and maybe some of the people that do practice it are in this room. But, but landmarks law and preservation is ultimately about our physical culture and the city. But yet our faith in planning at this point is such that we actually don't really produce 
plans anymore. We certainly don't teach them, at least at the school I'm in, once in a while, NYU. And we do have planners, but generally we have a kind of discipline that's emerging, I think an important one, that is not yet fully pulled into uh, the discussion, either at Landmarks Commission, which is called urban design. I mean, how many people out there would say that either they know about or practice urban design? A handful. And they're probably architects, probably not, but although there's probably a couple of lawyers that could say they're urban designers. Ultimately, and I'm going to jump into the seaport as an example, having read through both designation reports, the first one, and albeit I'm not a lawyer, so I only grasp those descriptive things, it struck me that, the first off, the designation reports are the only understanding we have of the law, ultimately, right? Because by the time something happens, we rely on the report, both as architects and lawyers, to determine what should happen next. So one thing I would put out there as an idea, because I like strong mayor systems, which I love as an architect. I also love strong laws, and I think the landmarks law should be enhanced. But you have to understand that what we all do is highly subjective, and, and the ideas about what makes great one decade and not so great another one is the strength preservation has because there can be a set of clues, at least from an urban design value sense. Now, this generally is not in, it wasn't in the Seaport report that I could find. There was this amazing scintillating history of maritime New York, which if any of you should read this report, it's unbelievable. There, there was a case-by-case -case description of, that it was quite detailed of which buildings were there and they weren't there, who were the architects that did them, what they were for at the time. But at the same time, there was almost nothing about why the district itself, in the fragment that it was left, was important to maintain and what the quality was beyond just the buildings themselves. So if each of these buildings had been picked up and placed on a blank slate somewhere, in my opinion, except for some discussion about the piers and the good work the, at the time the Seaport Museum was doing in bringing ships back to the piers, those ships were the only clue you would have gotten if you were an alien and reading this report that in fact the Seaport District if you just took it and picked it up and put it somewhere else, wouldn't be just fine. And we know that globally, these kinds of replicas of New York are happening all over the world. So I think you have to question whether there isn't something deeper in, I'll call it planning, but really I mean urban design, that needs to be picked up in these reports. And apparently there was one idea out there uh, before Landmarks Law happened, which was an idea of a kind of, um, uh, kind of, effect area, maybe whether it's 100 feet or one block around a district, this area of influence was something. Now, if that idea was picked up, I believe that you would then be forced in reports to actually report why that area of influence was important, what were the issues at stake in terms of urban design that needed to be acknowledged beyond the details of each building. So, okay, I'm gonna move on from that discussion, but the picture that you don't see up here was something that's a little bit beyond the seaport, which was the New Market Building, which at the time was too young to get designated. It was too, and many of you in the audience could argue on one side of it, that's a worthwhile building or it's not. But I would have to say, if you looked at the original designation report, the idea of how important the, um, the fish, uh, the selling of fish and the trading of fish was to why the seaport was even there when it got designated would certainly give you pause as to the decisions that I've seen come down the pike relative to the fish stalls, relative to the streetscape, and the kind of dereliction that we see our own city do on the behalf of what apparently, according to the original report, was the, the main deal in terms of designating the seaport. So then I move on to um, a modern piece of architecture that uh, one Chase Plaza, which was created in a whole different era 
In part, the designation report, equally to the seaport, talks about a building and the people behind it, its narrative. You know, what was Rockefeller up to? How did he convince everyone to build it here? How did they buy the property? Like that whole story. But I have to say, there's almost no text at all about how this building, this plaza, which it was, it was absolutely agreed that making the plaza flat allowed for a lot more public space, and no, no other architect was doing that at the time except for the Seagram building. So it was noteworthy because it was radical. And I'm sort of putting it out there, if planning, urban design, and architecture want to become relevant to another, we have to add why having a flat plaza is meaningful, why it would be meaningful in the future, so that when the commission is deciding whether to make the building looks like it floats just as much, right now it looks like it floats, or not enough, they have something to connect to. I think I'm, my time is up. Thank you. Next, we're going to bring up Brian J. McCabe, who's the Assistant Professor of Sociology at Georgetown University, and also a research associate at the Furman Center. Uh, great, thanks very much. Um, uh, so I'm a sociologist. It's uh, more often than not that I, I, I get invited to speak about this in uh, a room full of economists, uh, which is it's like throwing a sociologist in a shark tank. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some um, research that I've been doing with uh, Ingrid Ellen and some colleagues at the Furman Center at NYU. Uh, the talk is about pre preservation, gentrification, and neighborhood change on the impacts of historic preservation <clears throat> in New York City. Um, I'm going to address sort of two pieces of our research, and I'm going to focus on the findings with only a little bit of the methodology behind them. I can explain uh, most econometric models just using my hands, so I'll do that. But I'm happy to share the papers. Um, if, if folks are interested, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, so for the first part of what I want to talk about is the impact of preservation on property values, um, asking whether preservation of districts in New York uh, raises property values both within those districts and in the areas immediately outside of them, and whether this varies across neighborhoods in the city. Uh, and the second is about preservation and neighborhood change, so asking whether the preservation of a historic district <clears throat> leads to changes in the socioeconomic status, uh, the racial composition, or the housing market characteristics of, uh, of neighborhoods in New York City. So I'll go through both of these, uh, and then hopefully this will help to provide some nuance to understanding the, right, the impact of these policies that we've been talking about on, um, on neighborhoods and on properties uh, in New York City. Um, so for the first part of it, what we do in this paper uh, is we test what we call a, a theory of heterogeneous effects, right, to determine whether price impacts, the impact of preservation, varies across different neighborhoods in the city. Um, we do expect there to be a, an increase, and you'll see in a moment that there is, uh, and we estimate what we call a difference in difference model. Essentially what it does is it compares properties that are inside of a historic district right to those that are outside of them, controlling for all sorts of other characteristics. Uh, and in this paper, we're going to use all the residential sales data, so every property transaction in New York between 1974 uh, and 2009. So we have a huge universe of properties that have transacted um, during, this, during this period. Okay? Uh, just a visual to give you a sense of exactly what we're doing. This is uh, the gray area there is the Greenpoint Historic District. Right? So we have a set of properties that are inside that historic district. Uh, the dotted line is, the, is a 250-foot boundary that we've drawn around, right? And one of the reasons that we think that matters is you might get a lot of the benefits of being in a historic district by being in the boundary, right, but not actually in the district, right? You're, you get the preservation, the continuity of the neighborhood, uh, but you, you don't, you're not subject to the same set of restrictions. And so we compare those properties to other ones that sell in a neighborhood uh, that are within the census tract, but not actually inside of the district or inside of the boundary. So that's the, the sort of intuition behind uh, what we're doing. So the first thing that we find uh, that's consistent with what people expect is that um, <clears throat> properties that are located in an area that are historic districts or that will become them in the future, right? The great thing about using retrospective data is I can tell when a property sells if it's not in a historic district, if at some point in the future, right, it's going to become, it's going to be in one. 
So we find that those properties, um, regardless of whether the area is designated, they sell for about 20% more than comparable properties outside of the district, right? So this is accounting, this is essentially the architectural amenities, um, sort of better uh, features of the house, right? That's accounted for in that 20% bump. Um, what we find though is that after the designation of a historic district, um, we get an additional 17% boost in property values, right? So the actual policy impact of historic preservation is a 17% on average boost compared to other properties in the neighborhood. Uh, we also find that the preservation of a district, or the creation of a district leads to a 12% boost in the immediate surrounding neighborhood, in that buffer zone, right? So the, the policy impact um, extends beyond properties in just the district. The next thing we did is we look um, at Manhattan and uh, the boroughs outside of Manhattan. And inside of Manhattan, we find that uh, properties that are located in a district or in a place that is or will become a district sell for about 33% more, so there's a big bump for being there, but there's no impact and perhaps even a negative impact uh, after the designation of a historic district in Manhattan. The opposite is true outside of Manhattan, right? You get an average of a 13% boost uh, in neighborhoods outside of Manhattan uh, after the preservation of a district, right? So it suggests that neighborhoods outside of Manhattan are the ones that are really benefiting um, in terms of property value impacts from the preservation of historic districts. And then lastly, we look at um, neighborhoods by far and by buildable capacity. Um, so we're interested in whether or not uh, the price boost is higher in neighborhoods where there's an option to redevelop or lower and where there's less option to redevelop. Um, <clears throat> and essentially we find that where developers could build taller buildings in the absence of historic districts, right, the impact on property values is negligible, potentially even negative. Uh, in community districts where the median price per square foot is higher uh, or the maximum FAR is higher, uh, the impact is actually less positive, okay? So, so what we're trying to do in this paper is to note both that there are uh, property value impacts from historic preservation, but also to recognize that they vary across different neighborhoods or different kinds of neighborhoods uh, in New York City. So the, the second part of this um, talk that I want to give today uh, of our research is actually looking um, then not at property values, but at the way that uh, the characteristics of those neighborhoods change, right? The racial composition of a neighborhood, the socioeconomic status, the income, the kinds of people that are living in those neighborhoods. Uh, so to get us started on this, I put together this graph, which is just, um, uh, it's an analysis of census tracts. So census tracts, right, are... Um, uh, sort of what we think of as neighborhoods in, in the academic world, they're about 4,000 people. Uh, the gray bars are the tracks that are inside of historic districts or that contain historic districts, and the black bars are those that are outside of historic districts, right, that don't contain historic districts. So just the sort of basic story that'll, that'll motivate this intuition is that in 2010, which this data is for, you find that the tracks that have historic districts have a higher home ownership rate, they have a higher percentage of college educated residents, they have a lower poverty rate, they're more white, they're less African American, right? Um, so the question is, right, did historic preservation cause these changes or did it contribute to these changes, right, to making neighborhoods um, to be higher SES, a uh, higher percentage of white residents? So why is it that we think that uh, historic preservation may lead to these kinds of changes? So one is what I just talked about, right, property value impacts. It may be that as property values go up, right, these neighborhoods become more expensive, uh, rents might go up, um, and certain people can afford those neighborhoods and certain ones can't. Uh, a second that appeals always to the sociologist in me, although less to the economists, is that preservation right, sing signals uh, the presence and the preservation of historic amenities, right, that might be valued by some groups more than others, right, attracting them to the neighborhood even outside of any property value impacts. And then finally, right, it may be that uh, preservation limits the supply of affordable housing, especially if you get um, uh, townhouses or brownstones converted back into single family homes, right, there may simply be fewer uh, units that are available to, to, to rent, uh, and therefore uh, we may see an increase in property values changes in the neighborhood. So to do this, we actually merged uh, track level data. So we took all the tracks in New York City. We actually limit it to the ones that are located in community districts that have a historic district. So 32 of New York's 59 community districts have historic districts. Uh, in total, there's about 1,000 census tracts that we look at. We have a panel, so 1970, 1980, 99, or 90, 2000, 2010. And essentially, we estimate uh, what we call difference in difference again. Um, the easiest way, I, I really do like to do econometric models with my hands. Uh, the easiest way to think about it uh, for those that uh, don't run difference in difference models is, right, you may have two neighborhoods or two kinds of neighborhoods, so neighborhoods that become historic districts or that do not and those that do, and they might start off at different places, right? So the um, 
home ownership rate may be higher initially in the, the ones that are going to become a historic neighborhood. And so what we're interested in is the difference between those two lines, right? So if after the preservation of a historic neighborhood, right, the home ownership rate starts to go up in the, the one that was designated and, and continue the same trajectory in the other one, right, then we see that as the effect of historic preservation. So we're looking at the difference in those two sets of neighborhoods, essentially, the difference in that over time. So, uh, we uh, take all of the tracks in these neighborhoods and we put them into four categories. This is the Upper West Side Central Park Historic District. The gray area is the district. Uh, the, uh, the, the boxes, those, those black lines are the census tracks. And we essentially say every census track uh, in the city is one of four categories, either uh, that it has no lots that are in historic districts, um, that it has between 1 and 24% of lots, 25 and 75%, or more than 75% of lots, right? So this is how uh, we identify the different tracks. Uh, and we estimate this difference in difference model. And again, I'm happy to, to send along the paper if folks are interested in reading more about that. So here's what we find. Um, and I think that this is um, sort of surprising and not surprising for, for many people in the, the preservation and planning community. Uh, we find that in tracts that have between a quarter and 75% of their parcels in historic district, right? So tracts that are primarily composed of historic district, uh, we, see, so we see an increase in income of about 14% after designation, okay? And what happens, uh, we tend to see a, an immediate uh, boost and then a sort of slower boost over the next couple decades. Uh, it's a very similar story when you look at the share of college-educated residents there, right? So in tracts where at least a quarter of the, the parcels are in a historic district, uh, the percentage of college-educated residents climbs by about 5 or 10% following the designation. And then uh, the same intuition is true of the poverty rate. So in tracts uh, with at least a quarter of parcels in a historic district, we find that the poverty rate declines after designation, right? So it's a pretty consistent story that we see um, about the impact of preservation on socioeconomic status, right? Neighborhoods become wealthier, they have a higher share of college-educated residents, and the poverty rate goes down, right? Consistent with this idea that home values are going up, it's becoming harder for people to find affordable rents, and that these neighborhoods are becoming more attractive to a certain group of people. Now that said, uh, we actually find very little evidence, no evidence of racial change, of a change in the racial composition of neighborhoods, right? So a lot of folks are concerned about the relationship between preservation and gentrification, and we actually find that there's no change in the share of African-American households living in a neighborhood after designation. We do find a small increase uh, by about 3% in white households, although there's no change in the white household population after uh, when we look outside of Manhattan. Uh, and then sort of similar with the income story, we see that in neighborhoods where at least a quarter of the parcels are in historic districts, right? The home ownership rate rises by about 12 percentage points. We actually don't see much of a change in rents following designation, okay? So some empirical evidence um, to sort of add to this conversation, I think, about the impact of the policies that we've been talking about um, uh, today. Um, just to, to, to sort of sum up and, and where we are as researchers and what we think our contribution in here is. So I think the first is that our findings offer some pretty mixed evidence for researchers concerned about preservation and gentrification, right? The story is, um, um, not, uh, not so sort of crystal clear, not so one-sided uh, as, as people often think. Um, our contribution really is not to the resolution of these debates, but instead, right, to add some nuance to the discussion, to think about the different kinds of impacts that are happening. Uh, and then I think also to point to some of the uh, costs and benefits of preservation when we consider efforts uh, to mitigate displacement while at the same time, right, preserving the, the historic amenities of these neighborhoods. So, thank you. Freeman, who's the director of Ur the Urban Planning Program at Columbia University. Uh, good afternoon. I think uh, Brian's research serves as a nice segue into what I'm going to talk about today. I think, uh, as Brian's research suggests, preservation, um, the, the act of trying to preserve neighborhoods, can actually spark change in neighborhoods. And so I think as we, think, as we talk about the links between preservation and planning, um, it's important to consider that preservation can actually lead to a type of change. And as, as a result, I would suggest that, that uh, be, it behooves us to think about planning when we think about preservation. Um, and, and here I'm defining gentrification as the process by which central urban neighborhoods that have undergone disinvestment and economic decline experience a reversal, reinvestment, and the in-migration of relatively well-off middle and upper-class populations. And there's a number of factors that um, contributed to gentrification in the post-World War II era, 
you can divide them both on the supply side and think about um, investment capital or real estate developers looking for higher returns to capital. Um, and so looking in areas that had been overlooked previously. You could also point to political choices made by city leaders thinking about ways to rebuild their tax base. But you could also consider uh, the demand side. You know, what are residents doing or people who live in the city thinking about? Um, some of it was driven by changes in the urban economy. So many cities, New York included, grew up in part due to industrialization. In the era of deindustrialization, um, the manufacturing base has been replaced by producer services, uh, the information economy, and the like. And those economies that I'm describing um, here prefer oftentimes central city locations. There's also been demographic changes, right? So people are marrying later, having f fewer children, and so the suburban amenity package is not as attractive. And then finally, there have been changes in taste, right? Uh, Brian alluded to this as well. Oftentimes, people are rejecting or have rejected suburban locations thinking about or searching for what they consider an authentic environment. And what could be more authentic than a 19th century historic brownstone? So that's the link to preservation. Um, it's these very factors that um, have made central cities more attractive. Oftentimes, it's older neighborhoods with distinctive architecture that are candidates for um, landmark designation or historic preservation. And those also, that's very neighborhoods that oftentimes undergo gentrification. Uh, Brian spoke about this a little bit, um, although he kind of hedged um, the terminology he used, but I, I'll, call it, I'll call it gentrification. And I was interested in um, Property values are important and demographic change, but what do the people who are there, how do they feel about that? And that's some of the research that I have done. Um, I interviewed people who were living in Clinton Hill in Brooklyn, which is part of a, a historic district, and also in Central Harlem, which also has historic districts. And so when I asked people how they felt about the gentrification or how they felt about the way their neighborhood was changing, I actually didn't use the term when doing the interviews, um, they were ambivalent, I think you could say, right? They were both positives, right? So the positives came in the form, for example, some people were fortunate enough to own their homes, having purchased their homes prior to the big run-up in housing prices in the, in the uh, past few decades. And so as Brian's research suggests, and as we know um, just from reading the newspapers or living, our own living experience, there, would have been a big, there has been a big increase in housing prices, so many people were fortunate enough to uh, benefit from that. People talked also about appreciating the improvements in amenities and services. There were different types of stores that were opening up, uh, different types of restaurants, and people appreciated that. They appreciated that they no longer had to travel to perhaps Midtown or downtown Brooklyn to shop or to sit down and have a nice meal. Um, and some people also appreciated the increased diversity in their neighborhood and the sense of pride that they had in their neighborhood, right? So um, this is particularly the case in central Harlem, which for many years um, during the 1960s and 70s really was experiencing a lot of disinvestment, a lot of crime, a lot of abandonment. And so people took a sense of pride in feeling that people wanted to come to live in their neighborhood. On the other hand, there were, were negatives as well, not surprisingly, and we perhaps have heard a lot about that. People talked about being fearful of being pushed out, and they meant that not only in, in perhaps what we would anticipate, feeling like they would no longer be able to afford to live in their neighborhood, but also this sense of being pushed out of the neighborhood and that they were no longer welcome there, right? So even if they were able to stay in the neighborhood if they lived in a rent-regulated apartment, for example, or they lived in public housing. They still felt like they might be, they were being pushed out of the neighborhood because while they may, may appreciate some of the stores that were opening, there were many that they didn't feel welcome in. Um, sometimes they also talked about feeling like the police were cracking down more heavily now that the neighborhood was changing. Um, there also, also oftentimes were conflicts over the use of public space 
Um, how, what's acceptable use for public space? Should we allow, for example, dogs to run around off their leash or not? Should we cook out in parks or not? So some simple things that we might take for granted when you bring together people from different backgrounds with different expectations can cause conflicts as well. And then finally, there was a, a great deal of resentment about why this was happening, right? So they appreciated that the neighborhood was changing and in many ways improving, but many people were resentful of the fact that they felt that it was happening for them. And oftentimes, this was presented uh, with racial overtones, right? Many of these neighborhoods, particularly Central Harlem, and to a lesser extent, Clinton Hill were predominantly African American for a number of decades. And so many people interpreted the changes or the improvements as something that was not being done for their benefit, but for the benefit of people who were coming into the neighborhood. So that's just a brief summary of, of um, some of my findings about the way people were interpreting uh, their experience in living in a neighborhood that was undergoing gentrification. As a planner, I think there are some important things that we should think about. Um, one, from a social justice perspective, right? We have concern for people's feel, fears that they're being pushed out um, for, or even losing their home due to a lack of affordability. I would also say for utilitarian reasons, right? There's a lot of talk among policymakers for creating and preserving mixed income neighborhoods. There was a lot of uh, fanfare about the research that was done by Raj Chetty, or it was produced by Raj Chetty last summer showing how opportunity, a child's opportunity is really dependent upon the socioeconomic mix of the neighborhood that they grow up in. And so to me, I think gentrification can provide an opportunity to take advantage of that, but it's not something that will naturally happen without us taking this into consideration. So my, the main point I wanted to make here, and I think um, Brian's work perhaps did this well for me, is that preservation itself can spark change, right? And we might think of it as an act of preserving a neighborhood, but by that very act, we oftentimes set in motion forces that will change that neighborhood, even if the physical fabric is not changed, the social and economic fabric are also changed. And so that calls on us to think about planning while we're doing preservation so that we can not only preserve the physical and built environment, but think about ways of maintaining, preserving, and um, creating a healthy social and economic environment as well. Thank you. Thank you. And last, we'll bring up Kenneth K. Fisher, a lawyer at Cozen and O'Connor. Uh, I'm from the government. I'm here to help you. Yeah, you know, it should be applauded because let's not forget that we are talking about the awesome police power of the state for the welfare of the public to be able to regulate the most fundamental of uh, property, land. Um, so I'm, I'm just a simple lawyer from Brooklyn, and I'm probably going to oversimplify uh, some very complicated things that you've heard much more eloquently um, from others. Um, if I do, first, please bl uh, blame me, uh, and for anything controversial I say, not my clients or, uh, or my firm. Um, if you like what I say, see me afterwards. But I feel a little bit like um, Lindsay Lowen's most recent boyfriend, nursing homes. But there's also a value level to planning, and that is what kind of an area would, would we want? And tools are usually expressed as either context, let's keep it the way it is despite the market, or inducement, let's invite the market in uh, to change things for the better. Let me illustrate. On the first anniversary of the Landmarks Law, the Domino Sugar uh, Complex on the Williamsburg waterfront epitomized the industrial waterfront and it generated thousands of jobs. By the 10th anniversary, the city of New York overall had lost 600,000 jobs, many of them manufacturing jobs from that very same neighborhood. By the 25th anniversary of the Landmarks Law, that era was almost over, and we were making hard choices about reindustrialization with the threat that we would be getting garbage transfer stations and power plants and not factory jobs. By the 35th anniversary of the Landmarks Law, the plant was closed, the waterfront rezoned for residential use, uh, and the oldest building uh, designated as a, as a nod to the area's industrial past. 
Now on the 50th anniversary, we can foresee Domino's adaptive reuse as it evolves to meet the New York's 21st century through the value proposition that talent means vitality and we attract and retain talent by giving it places to live, work, and play, uh, induced in this case by a change in the zoning. And by the way, I predict that on the 75th anniversary, um, we will already be discussing whether the iconic buildings of New Domino should be individually designated as they come of age, even as memory of the original industrial heritage becomes vestigial. So why do we preserve it all? Well, anyone, uh, I think for many of us, it's as basic as the proposition that we are stewards of our heritage for future generations, and you don't compromise the family heirlooms. However, anyone who's emptied their childhood home knows that there's a difference between the Royal Copenhagen that your grandparents gave your parents on their uh, wedding and the Franklin Mint Christmas plates that they gave them every year after that, no matter how much you enjoyed them as a kid. The Landmarks Law pre presumes that protection will be given to buildings and structures that contribute to the vitality of the city and not just evoke nostalgia for another time or are pleasing to the eye. In fact, as Jerry reminded us this morning, it evokes tourism, economic development, neighborhood preservation, and the ability to be a world-class city in its preamble, and not just preservation for preservation's sake. And I would argue that in the digital age, authentic is even more important, more valuable than ever before, and that's why we don't designate the interiors of TGIF restaurants, no matter how well done their paneling and Tiffany lamps are. It's, why, it's also why the IBO study, Independent Budget Office study, um, that also looked at values found that in bad times, designated districts went down less in value than the neighboring buildings, and in good times, as we've heard, uh, they go up faster. The urban revitalization movement was born in, in, in Park Slope, in part, at a time when banks refused to write mortgages there, um, and it came from the passion of people like Everett and, and Evelyn Ortner, but it was writ large because they were backed by Brooklyn Union Gas, now National Grid, Cinderella project um, that financed the renovation of brownstones because the gas company was afraid of losing their rate base. They were not inconsistent values. So yes, if you tore down my house in Brooklyn Heights and put up a bigger building, it would probably be worth more. But I, I would argue that if Otis and his band of rabble-rousers had been unsuccessful, that Dick Fisher, the former CEO of Morgan uh, Stanley, would not have been involved in one Pierpont Plaza, it's where Hillary's headquarters is now, the forerunner of Metrotech, if he didn't live in Brooklyn Heights. And Joe Steinberg, the chairman of the Lacadia Corporation, would not have invested in Renaissance Plaza, where the Marriott is, um, and the St. Anne's Warehouse Theater, of which he's the board chair, if he had not lived in Brooklyn Heights. And I know that because he told me that that was, in fact, the case. So, you know, there were policy choices to be made, and that's why I wish my friends at Rebney would not argue that preservation impedes the development of affordable housing. By that measure, so does the protection of Central Park. Um, however, I, 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 and, and I've said this both publicly and privately to some of my friends in the preservation movement, I wish they wouldn't argue that gentrification um, is impeded by designation because the public would rather hear what people are for and why it should be designated than what they're, uh, they're against. And I would also point out that to the extent that we're concerned about questions like density and building forms, that um, the, the tool to use, as Otis did with the limited height district, is zoning as opposed to using designation of districts simply uh, to prevent change. Now, the reason I say this is because the consensus for preservation is fragile. And as anybody who's been following the push and pull uh, in the city council initiated by Rebney uh, knows. And I think it's, it's important to be for preservation and not against development. The elected officials who balance these choices have competing needs that they're trying to satisfy. And that's why I have said on more than one occasion, and I'm gonna say it again now, that um, for the Landmarks Commission, if you want the public to know what a landmark is, you have to be prepared to say what a landmark isn't. And I hope you'll keep that in mind uh, during the backlog uh, deliberations. And yes, I'm talking to you, Menachi and Fred and the other commissioners. <laughs> New, York, New York can't be Lake Wobegon, where all the buildings are above average. 
Now this takes me to the elephant in the landmark room, and that's religious and not-for-profit uh, landmarks. Let's remember that the key to the constitutionality for landmarks is the ability to transfer unusable development rights from a landmark like Grand Central to a broader district. How'd that work out, Paul Silver? Um, anyway, we have granted similar flexibility for preservation purposes to districts like the South Street Seaport and the Theater District, where they get more latitude than other landmarks uh, would have. There's no doubt in my mind that the first time that the mayor went to see the Cardinal early in his administration to talk about getting the Pope to come to visit New York, and he got to visit that $170 million renovation, that the Cardinal happened to mention to him the 1.2 million square feet of unused development rights associated with St. Patrick's for which there is no receiving site. It doesn't matter that they can be transferred across the street pursuant to a special permit. And after the Pope's successful visit, there's no doubt in my mind that as we speak, city planning staff is trying to figure out how to accommodate the diocese in the Midtown East rezoning so that it can continue its important work. Because unlike a private business, the Cardinal cannot relocate his operation from the church built upon a mighty rock. He can't bring in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to drum up more business on Sunday. And he can't transfer title to an SBE to access historic tax credit investors as a private owner uh, would. And I'm all for it. I think they should be giving flexibility to St. Patrick, St. Bart's, and Central Synagogue. But I would also ask for the same consideration for the other 180 or so individually designated um, landmarks that are owned by religious and not-for-profit organizations who have the prestige, but quite frankly, the burden of being under the jurisdiction of the commission, and who between them have 25 million square feet of air rights that they have not been able to dispose of over the 50 years of the landmarks law. And by the way, those 180 uh, organizations between them support over 700 um, social service uh, programs. They simply don't have a market. Now there's a, a solution to this a problem, way too complicated to go into uh, today, called Landrex. Please take a look at our, our, uh, our website at nyclandrex.com, um, and what you'll see is that there is a way to, to leverage the resources of preservation to meet planning social service needs, and there is a way to leverage planning uh, to meet preservation needs and protect those 180 buildings for the next 50 years. Thank you. Thank you all. Some very provocative and interesting concepts put forward. Um, I have a number of questions that I want to ask our panelists, and I'm also going to give them an opportunity to make some inquiries of each other. If Although it's a little hard for you to see each other, I realize. Um, if you have some questions about what others spoke about. And then I would love to turn to the audience and see if there are questions from the audience. And in past sessions, there haven't been too many. So, but if, you know, I think this has been very provocative. And I would imagine there are a few questions from the audience. I think there are microphones that will circulate. Um, but first, I think a question, conveniently, you guys sitting next to each other. Um, this issue of gentrification and the economic impacts in communities of landmark designation. And I guess it's really kind of a pullback policy question. How are we to think about both of your sets of research in light of some of the decisions that the Landmarks Commission makes? I mean, as you know, the commission has autonomy. It has a strict set of criteria that it establishes uh, of significance of architecture, culture, and heritage. It is really meant to be independent of many of the other agency concerns and city concerns. But what you're talking about, of course, are the impacts on the economy, on the culture, on the society of specific neighborhoods. And I think many people in preservation are thinking about those impacts as well, many preservation advocates, and wondering just how might we apply your research to both landmarking decisions, or is there some other kind of approach we should be taking and looking at the historic qualities of the neighborhoods. You can trust Ross. Sure, that's a good question. I, I think what it calls for is the need for um, there to be a planning process that considers both the uh, historic historical significance of the area and planning more comprehensively. Now, I think that's a strength of landmarks, its autonomy, uh, but somehow 
we need some type of coordination uh, because I think you know you run the risk without that that the political support for landmarks can can be a, can erode if people for whatever reason would t would think that there are decisions while perhaps favorable for preserving buildings but are having consequences that they, um, the public does not agree with. So I think some, um, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not directly answering the question because I'm not sure what the best mechanism would be hmm. for coordinating, creating that type of coordination, but I think the, the need is definitely there. Mm -hmm. to, for more interagency coordination. Correct. Mm -hmm. Brian. Yeah, I, I mean, we've um, sort of had conversations that are similar to, to what Lance is talking about, about uh, a lot of these policies, landmarks and others, have consequences that are sort of unintended and, and sometimes unforeseen, and, and sometimes it takes you know decades of data to look back and say right what actually happened in, in some of these neighborhoods. So, um, and I think also not only thinking about it within the context of uh, landmarks and sort of other agencies of the city, but landmarks and other processes that are going on in the city as well, right? So it may sort of contribute to a process of gentrification or to neighborhood change, um, but there are a lot of other processes going on in New York that. Are contributing to that as well. So it's partly sort of as we thought about it in, in connection with other agencies that are, right, HPD and groups that are working to do affordable housing development to preserve affordable housing and thinking about, right, are there sort of extra protections that could happen in landmark neighborhoods, but also another set of processes that are happening in places like New York, uh, right, that are leading to this kind of change outside of, outside of preservation. So somehow capturing all of these processes, looking at everything somewhat on the table together. I mean, do you can you envision how that would work? Uh, I'm um, press you a little, and maybe press Lance yeah. too. I mean, I, I would think I, I would also add. I think that um, I'm not sure to the extent to which Brian's research captures this. I, I think sometimes the uh, gentrification also can lead to the um, preservation, right? Because the people who are coming yes. into the community, um, who are drawn there, perhaps because of the, sign the significance of the architecture, might then um, seek to use the power of the state to protect that. So I, I don't know if, if Brian's research addressed that sort of dual causality. Yeah. Um, and so you would hopefully people coming in um, who are effectively changing the neighborhood would do it in a way that mobilizes and empowers everyone in the community. And that might include using landmark designation um, but there are other things that communities do to revitalize themselves and change themselves. And, and so ideally, they would um, affect neighborhood change in a holistic way that empowers all the residents in the neighborhood. Uh, I know it sounds like a pipe dream, but. Okay, okay. we're all, you know, this is a good place to, to you know, put those out there. As long as we're pipe dreaming, I'll, I'll add two pipe dreams. Okay. Uh, no, so I mean, I think one is, um, right, we do a lot of work, and this sort of comes more from, uh, maybe federal housing subsidies or federal homeownership subsidies, but to subsidize homeownership, mm -hmm. right? To to encourage people to invest in homeownership through the mortgage interest deduction and things like that. So so you know one is that we could think about a, a set of subsidies either modeled on the interest deduction or on housing choice vouchers, something like that, that would encourage residential stability. So so individuals that are facing displacement as a result of rising rents, right? We could we could envision a model even at the local level, right? That subsidizes. Um, uh, that, that subsidizes rents to avoid displacement from things like gentrification or from preservation. Uh, you know, I think the, the second big one is that, um, right, there's a huge exemption on capital gains taxes on, on home sales, right? Mm -hmm. So if I sell my house and I make $200,000 from it, right, I, I've just earned $200,000 tax-free, right? And especially if we think that, um, if we see that property values are going up because you're in a gentrified, or because you're in a, a gentrified or preserved neighborhood, right? You're sort of doing nothing to, to, to make that profit, right? Maybe the, mm -hmm. the luck of buying somewhere or the work you did to advocate for that neighborhood change. But we can imagine instead of a capital gains exemption, uh, either federal or local policies, right, that take a proportion of that and reinvest in those neighborhoods, right? So we take the, the profit that's made from housing sales that, that are the direct result of gentrification, the direct result a preservation and actually put that back into the neighborhood. Interesting, bringing you folks into the conversation. Any thoughts or comments about that? Specifically, Claire, I was very intrigued by your South Street Seaport comment that what was so intriguing to you and what was interesting and what was important about the place was the fish market. And the fish market is, is a use of a place, not just a physical you know, amenity or not just a physical quality or characteristic. And I'm wondering how what, what policy change might we contemplate 
where thinking about the place as a fish market and thinking about its design and thinking about its history and preservation might come together. Well, I think it, it gets to some of the, the kind of deep problem here, which is planning is really a, on a separate stream from landmarks and preservation. And so you can watch the outcome of something change, or in planning you can determine that there's some uses that have value or that may have value 25 years that don't have value right now that you as a city have to recognize. And I think the discussion about industry even coming back to the city mm -hmm. now really should give a lot of credit to many people who actually preserve some industrial buildings, whether they were in East Harlem, Red Hook, West Harlem, now that are actually highly desirable and can be used for industry. And then yet we saw so many buildings that were not landmarked because maybe their use wasn't so attractive who aren't there anymore. And the sort of Ken, t it was great to hear a lawyer actually talk about the quality and authenticity, but ultimately I don't think anyone can predict planning decisions. I think the issue is can landmarks for the sake of authenticity and history take some risks in saying there's types of buildings that you don't know what their future use is, but it actually wa was an important building. So the one I cited, for example, was the New Market Building, very controversial, uh, one, but one of the last remaining, uh, in addition to the Tin Market Building, fish buildings. But at the same time, I think there's many, many buildings like that all over the city who you may not be able to pull in a use. You know, the fish market's gone, but there might be a new use about to come that could benefit from that building. But I, I do think planning and those decisions are on separate tracks. <laughs> Any thoughts, Randy? <clears throat> Uh, I would uh, endorse the, the, the TDR, um, the use of TDRs, for instance, the use of tiered listings. Uh, there, there are a number of different ideas uh, in other cities as well as already in New York about uh, more flexible public policy tools. Um, the uses of incentives are, um, you know, are, are demonstrated to have you know, very positive um, economic, measurable economic uh, impact and, and benefit, and they also are often catalytic in design terms. Um, for you know, for whole districts and whole cities, so I think um, we need more flexibility in more ways. Um, that I think is a, is should be a uh, a big push. I, I don't I don't think that should be done without to speak to my own day to day brief. Um, educating the next generation of built environment professionals, um, whether no matter what name degree they're going after, that they have to be aware of the the dynamics that connect these. Uh, the, these different desires that we have with the built environment. So preservationists who know more about urban design and economics, urban designers and architects who know more about the history and performance of a traditional building, um, and, and so on and so forth. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's got to be um, a, a collective recognition that no one field has all the answers. Um, and I think the, the last thing is, and, and more, maybe it throws it back to, uh, um, to the, the sociologists and, ec and economists that we don't really have any data on feedback of preservation. Mm -hmm. The only feedback we get is the politics of advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to discern economic impact, but that's all post facto. We don't, we don't do uh, what we do with any expectation or way to gather data on it. Um, that has to change um, as, as data becomes more important to all kinds of decision making. And there are ideas out there for how to do that. Um, but again, the, um, the field really hasn't caught up to the rest of the built environment professions in, in that regard. And Ken, coming from city government, your perspective on how to make these kinds of policy changes, and I think to Randy's point specifically, I think the metrics issue is really critical and something that a lot of us are thinking about. How do we both try to set metrics by which we make public policy decisions, but also prepare for measurement after the fact? And to what extent is that the role of the landmarks law? Getting back to our, you know, our core topic today. One of the, I think there's a couple of um, barriers to getting things right. One is a rule for most elected officials, which is don't help everybody if it hurts anybody. So don't 
don't allow a neighborhood to gentrify, even if that reduces crime, generates tax revenues, and makes millionaires out of people who stuck out of the bad times, if you're going to make tenants uncomfortable that they can't afford to walk into the Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee and feel that they're being pushed out of their own neighborhoods. It doesn't mean that any of those um, perspectives are illegitimate. They just may be in conflict, and it's very difficult to reconcile them. And I also think that we make a mistake sometimes of thinking that we know what the consequences of our actions are going to be. Mm -hmm. So when Robert Moses uh, couldn't tear down uh, Soho, uh, a lot of the impetus of it may have been the architecture, but it was also preserving industrial jobs that were going to disappear no matter what as soon as you could print something on a laser printer instead of a giant Heidelberg press. Um, and yet I don't think people anticipated that those um, spacious loft apartments were then going to be occupied by artists and then after the artists by, by bankers and, and, and brokers. We sometimes just don't know what the consequences of our actions are going to be. So being able to measure things in real time, uh, the power of computers, it took, it took um, 10 years for the IBO to do um, the study of the impact of historic designations after Andrew Aristoff and I uh, commissioned the report. I don't know how long it took your research, but I suspect that you had a better computer system uh, that, that they did. So I think that, I think that the, you know, the advocacy part of it is, is really critical. If, if, um, if you're not at there pushing a position forward, then uh, you're not going to be heard. If you do put a, push a position forward and you use the right vocabulary, it can be heard. We um, had some success. When, when I was in the council, I, I, I represented a district that had um, all or part of, I think, six or seven historic districts, which made me a very a passionate advocate when you have a constituent like Otis Pearsall. Um, but a lot of the council was very reluctant to interfere with property rights. And we had some success in advocating for the creation of historic districts outside of Manhattan and outside of the, of the Brownstone Belt by talking about the vitality and economic impact the, uh, of those. So the Jackson Heights District, we had as many people come and testify about how important Jackson Heights was for people from all over Southeast Asia and South America than we did come and talk about the innovative um, you know, garden apartments. So those are the kinds of arguments that, that you can make if you use the kind of vocabulary that the audience is going to be receptive to. Mm -hmm. And I guess moving on to thinking about the preservation advocates and preservation community and to building a constituency for preservation, you talked about the need for pres to be pro-preservation and also pro-development, I'm paraphrasing, but to kind of embrace that both we can preserve the past while also seeing places developed. And Randy pointed out the fundamentalist approach that sometimes preservationists tend to take where it's always about a fight and it's always about saying no and it's always about refusing to allow change or, or advocating strenuously against change. How do we reconcile these things? Is there a, a way forward? And, and again, back to the Landmarks Law and the Landmarks Commission, what should the commission's role perhaps as an agency, or is there some role that the law should be playing in, in, in any of those things? Does, it, does being more pro build new things denigrate the Landmarks Law? Does it impact it negatively? Is it, is it, are we risking the law by doing so? And how do we bring constituents into the conversation in a meaningful way? Claire? I mean, this is uh, probably an unpopular opinion. But one way to look at it is if there was a gr I don't consider 33,000 buildings affected or 14 very large compared to the building stock of New York City. And uh, when you look at a lot of neighborhoods, uh, even outside of Manhattan, that have incredible building stock, Maybe if there was just a lot of landmark districts, the kind of focus on the menu part wouldn't be possible, but the focus on uh, preservation and landmarks as being a catalyst for figuring out where in a neighborhood development should be, and really maybe even more inventive ways as architects to add to buildings would be possible. I think part of the problem is there's not enough landmark districts at this point, not enough landmarks, that you end up focusing on the same neighborhoods and the same buildings over and over again. And you think that is a source of the controversy? I think that it could be a, a powerful shift of paradigm mm -hmm. if we actually looked at um, the kind of uh, assets, both legal and architectural assets, as something to learn from and something that actually is a job earner 
I mean, one thing comment I would have about Soho and Chelsea is if those buildings, those cast iron buildings, wouldn't be there, the job density we're seeing in the kind of um, new economy or we work even today, you would not see in New York. I mean, those buildings wouldn't be there. So I really think that uh, it's a huge asset. Can, can I say, can I Preservation and development are in conflict. It's a struggle and it's a push-pull. Preservation and prosperity are not. And I think that's what, what some of us have been trying to say. Now, I'm not suggesting that Florence is as prosperous as New York and that you want to freeze everything and everything will be just fine. But, but I do think that um, there's been a shift um, in the last 20 years towards government being more proactive. If you think back to the fights in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, uh, the pattern was the same. Government was drowning in red ink, it was struggling, um, and some developer would come in, put a plan on the table, and then we all knew what to do, right? The, the community would go nuts and the editorial boards and everybody had their assigned roles. I think that started the shift in the early days of the Bloomberg administration when Amanda Burden was very proactive about, um, about uh, going into areas and rezoning large stretches of, of the city. But I also think that under, uh, under Jennifer Rabb and, and Bob Tierney, uh, and we saw the numbers during Ka uh, Sarah's presentation, that the commission became much more uh, ambitious in terms of, of doing large uh, designations. And so I think that that, that it creates many more opportunities for the public to be engaged, to be able to weigh in, provided that we give the, the agencies the resources they need mm -hmm. to be able to con uh, conduct public outreach in, a, in an effective way. And the last thing is, in my view, the commission, which is dominated by architects, ought to be calling it um, as they see it with respect to the architecture and the history and, and, and the heritage. In theory, the City Planning Commission is supposed to weigh in. I'm not aware of any instance where the Planning Commission of record actually modified the boundaries of the district. I know when it came to the Vinegar Hill District, the Jennifer Rabb, Joe uh, Rose and I sat down and talked about you know, which block should be in and what he was prepared to rezone if we didn't put it in the, uh, in the district. But I'm not aware of whether that a, uh, was a one-off or, uh, or a regular sure. practice. But I do think that the City Planning Commission should be encouraged to use a different lens for sure. evaluating it and to be, play a much more, uh, much more than just a perfunctory role. And of course, ultimately, it's the City Council, uh, a bunch of elected politicians that um, have little training in any of these issues except on the job training. Um, that are going to be making the ultimate decisions. Thoughts about that? The, further thought about it? Preservation and prosperity issue. Very interesting issue. Yeah, yeah. The only other thing that sort of comes out of our research, I think, is that uh, looking at the differential impact, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that it, there may be a, a benefit for the city as a whole, and there may be we're doing some work now that. Um, on, uh, on jobs and job growth in historic districts, so at some point we'll have that. But there, there may be right differential impact that some people really do benefit from this, and some neighborhood residents do, and, and others don't. Mm -hmm. So looking at it more closely, continued yeah. research. Um, are there questions from the audience? Anyone have a question? Don't be shy. Oh, I see a hand way in the back. <laughs> A lot of colleagues who've been doing uh, research on kind of explain, expanding the reach of preservation, not just looking at designated historic buildings, but looking at what they're calling older buildings. And so in, in the city of Los Angeles, for example, that's been you know, very proactive in using adaptive reuse ordinances to help increase housing stock or affordable housing. I think they've realized something like 14,000 additional housing units. Um, in what we would call older buildings, not necessarily in historic districts, but um, you know, we're hopeful this can be a way of maybe offsetting some of those, uh, those downsides that you mentioned. Yeah, thank you for raising that. I think the question had be been raised earlier about the tiered approach, and I'm wondering is that something, 
you know, by, you know, looking at different tools and applying different levels of designation or, you know, this is something that is being done in so many places around the country. Um, maybe this is a better question for the next panel, which I hope they will address, what, how people feel about that. Is that something that we would want to see? Um, and does that require an adaptation of the landmarks law or is that the creation of a new tool such as conservation district zoning or other types of tools? Any thoughts about that? Oh, come on, I know you're thinking about it. I, would, I, I might be going back to the last question as opposed to answering that one, but, <laughs> uh, um, but I think they're related. The, despite the fact that I'm, used, I'm often critical of preservationist thinking, I actually think that preservationist culture is essential. And I, I don't think it should or, or will go away. Mm -hmm. But what I think, what I guess I hope will happen uh, if all of these suggestions are taken up is that, um, that the, the contribution of preservationist urbanism will be um, counterweighted by um, more you know, generalist thinking, if you think about other ists. Um, and you know, council people, for instance, are generalists in, in a you know, purposeful way. Um, people who are trained in, in architecture and urban design and historians, there, you know, there are lots of generalist ways to be trained. I, I make the analogy often um, with students to um, med medicine. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you want to be better, you don't just pick a specialist and go to it, right? You, pick, you go to your GP, hopefully you go to your GP, your, you know, the general practitioner, to get some sort of holistic perspective on how you're doing. And they don't just <coughs> pick a treatment out of the air. You don't you just say, I, I want some surgery. And, you know, what they measure, like they, they, they get feedback. They, they take measurements, they ask you how you're doing, they, they do all different kinds of research, and then they provide a solution. It's not as if like the, the solution is already, you know, um, you know, pre-exist your problem. So I think taking that more holistic and generalist and, uh, and I don't know, with a, a feedback-centered approach to the way that we think about preservation um, will complement good old-fashioned preservationist um, thinking and, uh, and I think, you know, get closer to doing what we want preservation to do in all those other places, uh, typical neighborhoods. Great. Okay, with that, I will thank the panel very much. Thank you all for your great attention.